Good morning, so to speak. Respected elders, dear sisters and brothers. Uh, it's my privilege and honor to welcome our brothers from Kishan Elif today. Uh, Shri Ravi Kumar, Shri Abhay Deshpande and Shri Siddhartha. Uh, we have kindly agreed uh, to end us as well. Extremely thankful to them for coming all the way from Bharti uh, to share their thoughts with us. Just to give you all a perspective, uh, the three of them, uh, they had given a talk last year during the All India Conference on experience of coordinating bhajans before Bhagwan. And we thought there is no better than them who has spent their lifetime with Bhagwan uh, to, to advise us, to guide us, uh, and tell us Bhagwan's message to us regarding bhajans. Uh, it was year 1991. Sunday morning bhajans had started. At 9.10, Swami came inside the auditorium. And Ravi would probably recall this incident. Swami sat on the throne. One bhajan had got over, the next bhajan was about to start. For some reason, the person who was about to start the bhajan, he couldn't start the bhajan on the right scale. Swami stared at him. Uh, and because Swami stared at him, he became very nervous. Uh, and because he was nervous, he couldn't sit properly. Bhajan became a disaster. Swami stopped the bhajan after first speed. Now look at the mental uh, situation of the person coming next. By now, Swami is glaring at everybody as to how can boys sing like this. The person who is about to start the next bhajan, he is not mentally tuned to start because Swami has stopped after first speed. Normally, you know, there's a buffer, second speed hota hai, the next singer starts uh, getting used to the fact that he's going to sing. Ab suddenly, Bhagavan ne bhajan rok diya, the next singer, though he started on scale, uh, he couldn't sing properly, he was very nervous, and now, by, by now, Swami was glaring at, not just at the singers, everybody sitting in front. Swami stopped the bhajan at 9.20. Bhajans were not good. And Swami was coming out, and... Just at the door, you can see this door here. Just at the door, a person used to sit. Uh, he was responsible for the conduct of the bhajan. Swami is coming out. Boy is standing, he is also standing. Swami looked at him. And Swami just blasted him. He was very, very angry. He said many things, and two things stand out, and that's very relevant to what we're discussing today. He said, how can boys just come and sing like that? Don't they ever practice? That was one. Most important, second thing, what are you doing? What is your duty? Why are you not doing your duty? He is the bhajan conductor. Bhagavan was sending a message that in as much as a singer is responsible for his or her bhajan, uh, even greater responsibility lies with the person who is conducting the bhajan. So it's, it's, it was a message for everybody, the bhajan in charges, uh, that, that they have greater responsibility in, in the conduct of the bhajans. Uh, I will take their names and I would request them to come one by one. Uh, I will start with the youngest of the three, Sri Siddhartha. Sri Siddhartha hails from Chennai. He joined Sri Satsai Institute of Higher Learning for his MBA in 2006. And then, as advised by Bhagwan, he went back to Chennai, completed his MA in English from Loyola College, and thereafter, at Swami's behest, he again came back to Parthi and joined the faculty of the Sri Satsai Institute of Higher Learning. Currently, he is an assistant professor in the English department. <laughs> Sri Siddhartha had been part of the Sundaram Bhajan group for nearly a decade before joining Swami's college. He is a very talented and trained dramatist, a gifted speaker and a singer. He has been part of several cultural programs held in front of Bhagwan. He has directed, acted and written several of the significant plays held in the direct divine presence. Sri Siddhartha continues to train several students in the art of public speaking and dramatist and he is also a proud member of the Prashanti member group, Prashanti Mandir group. I would request Sri Amit Deshpande to come on stage, please. Sri 
Kahe Deshpande is a doctoral research scholar in the Department of Management Studies, Sri Satsai Institute of Higher Learning, Prashant Indiriam. He hails from Maharashtra and was a student of the Sri Satsai Primary School, Prashant Indiriam, from 1989 to 1993. He acquired his bachelor's degree in commerce from Bangalore University in 2000, then pursued chartered accountancy in Bangalore from 2000 to 2003. During this period, he worked briefly with Hewlett Packard in the Financial Services Center at Bangalore. He was a member of the Brindavan Bhajan Group and also a Brindavan Sevadal from 1999 to 2003. He enrolled for the MBA Finance Program at the Sri Satsai Institute of Higher Learning in 2003. Thereafter, at Bhagwan's behest, he registered for the MPhil Program in 2006 and was awarded the Gold Medal in 2007. He has been an organizer and participant in several cultural presentations and music programs. He has conceived, written, acted and directed several dramas. Importantly, the annual convocation function, dramas that have been staged in divine presence by the students of the university. Sri Amit Deshpande is currently pursuing his doctoral research in the area of corporate strategy and performance management systems in the Department of Management Studies of the Shri Satsai Institute of Higher Learning. May I now call upon Shri Ravi Kumar to come on stage, please. <laughs> we have heard of him, we have heard him. Last year he had come here to address us. I'll briefly give an introduction. Ravi joined Swami School in 14, 19. 78, when he was a seven year old. He completed his schooling from Sri Satsai High Secondary School in 1988, uh, did his BCom honors from Vrindavan campus in 91, and completed his MBA in 1993. Uh, thereafter, again at Swami's behest, he joined the Sri Satsai Super Specialty Hospital uh, in 1993, August 93. And since then, uh, Sri Ravi Kumar has been working in the urology department. Currently, he is working in the urology department as a senior manager. He has been there for the last 20 years now. But that's not what he's known for. He started singing in front of Bhagwan when he was just seven. And since his childhood, he is probably amongst the very, very few students uh, who Swami has personally <coughs> taught the art of singing bhajans. <coughs> Let me share with you some of his credentials. He has been amongst the youngest ever to sing in front of Bhagwan. <laughs> he was the first student from school to sing in Prashanti Mandir. Mohabbat ki kami dil mein agar ehsas hota hai, all of you have heard this kawali. This kawali, he has solely been blessed to sing and it has been physically hurt by Bhagwan at least 500 times. <laughs> Last but not the least, as the cliche goes, he could possibly be, possibly be Swami's highest capped singer, having sung bhajans for nearly three and a half decades. That's 35 years into 365 days, into twice a day. That's close to 25,000 times that he's sung in front of Bhagwan. That's a huge number. <laughs> All his experiences with Swami teach us lessons that we could imbibe in life to go closer to him and attain life's ultimate goal. A story goes, there was a Kannada, there is a poet from Karnataka uh, who prayed to Lord Vithala, Oh Lord, please grant me liberation. And Lord replied, if I grant you liberation, who will sing for me? <laughs> I sincerely believe uh, that Ravi was born to sing. Not just for himself, not for others, but only for God. May I now request three of you to start your session. A round of applause for this gentleman.
Swami, the one who beats as the heart beats in our hearts, the one who sings through each one of us, and also the one who listens as the Shrota in each one of us, our humble obeisance at his divine lotus feet. Most revered elders, dear brothers and sisters, Sairam to all of you. How matchless and how magical is this Sai Bhagavan, isn't it? Just to ask you all a few questions. What did you feel after listening to this matchless, beautiful bhajan? Hamsab Milkar Mangalagaya. Yes, anyone? How did you... What is the feeling? Ananda, Ananda. Yes, one of pure Ananda, bliss. Any other, any other impressions? Transported to Prashanti. Yes, transported to Prashanti or, or I should more importantly say, we transported Prashanti to Delhi. Yes. We just have to create the Prashanti Nilayam around us. And wherever there is Prashanti, 
there has to be Sai. Because Sai and Prashanti are not different. But I just wanted to, the reason I'm saying this is, that is the power of the Lord's name. And especially when the Lord's name is sung in a musical way. That's, that is the beauty of music coupled with singing the Lord's name. And to speak about the efficacy of Namasmarana, Swami has almost like given us like a festival offer, you know, you have this 30% off during Diwali, 70% off during Dashara. Like that, for Kali Yuga, Swami has said, you don't have to do Japa, Dhyana, none of that, Yajna, none of that, just chant my name. The simplest, the easiest way to reach me in this Kali Yuga is to chant the Lord's name. I guess he knew that we are not capable of doing anything else. <laughs> so busy, you know, very difficult to find a mountain or a forest these days also, to run away to. So, what is the importance of the name? Why is this, when we say Namasmarana, we are chanting God's name. What is the importance of this name? The name is associated with a form. So, for example, when we sang Sai Bhagavan, we have Swami's beautiful form in front of us. When we say Rama, when we say Krishna, we have those beautiful forms which come in front of our eyes. So that is the power of the word, that when we chant the name, the form is associated and that comes into our hearts. And the forms and all the attributes associated with the form. And I think another dimension to this whole thing is, just imagine a name like Rama or Krishna. Or just imagine a mantra like Om Namo Narayana. You know who chanted it? Prahlada has chanted Om Namo Narayana. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya before me was chanted by Dhruva. <laughs> just imagine the amount of potency that name has got. There is this aspect of faith. Where if you have faith, you don't even need a form that accompanies yeah. the word. For example, uh, when Ratnakara became Valmiki, when the Saptarishis told him to chant Mara, Mara didn't have any meaning for Ratnakara. It was just that Mara, 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 Mara became Rama, Rama, Rama. But for Ratnakara, it was just Mara. And he had the faith in him that the Saptarishis had told him, you chant Mara and this will take, take you across the ocean of Samsara. See, so you just had faith in that. So, so even if you don't have a form or an attitude associated with it, no problem. Just faith. Our scriptures have said we have to chant the name. Our Lord has told us that we have to chant the name of the Lord. That is, that should be enough for us to know. We need not know the exact meaning or you know the form associated or attitude. Another another point I think about Namaskarana is so why do we have to say it aloud? No, why not? Why can't we just keep repeating it inside? Why do we have to say Sai Bhagavan, Satya Sai Bhagavan? Is it not important if I just say? I'm saying it inside. You cannot hear it, right? Why is it necessary for me to say it aloud? And Bhagavan gives a very beautiful analogy over here. He says, if by mistake you fall into the well, okay, at the at the bottom of the well, no, you won't sit and do, you know, in your mind saying help, help, oh help. What, what are you going to do, right? You are going to shout out. You are going to say, help! Oh, is there someone out there? Please help me! We are in a very similar situation. Fallen into this samsara, fallen into this world, our condition is like that person who has fallen into a well. Okay, it's not enough by just chanting and say, it is more important to yell out to God. Just like Bhagavan said, when you go to the, to the house of the master and if there is a dog standing over there, Okay, there are two ways to overcome that, you know, pet is going to bark at you. One way is to overpower that dog, which is a very dangerous way to do it. The other one is just call out, master, master, master. And the master comes and he knows how to tame the dog. Right? Because the dog is domesticated by him. Similar is the case with Maya and the world. The Maya is like the dog. Either we overpower it by Jnana, you know, by all those different methods, self-inquiry and, you know, Atma, Sakshatkara, etc. Or the other simple one is simply call out, hey Krishna, oh Rama, come, just take your look after your dog, I want to come and meet you. So that is why it is necessary to say the name of the Lord. It's not just enough if you just say it in, inside of you. And remember, I mean, when we were you know, discussing some of the points to be discussed here today, 
I remember we stumbled upon one, one point where I asked you, Meera Bhai, Tukaram, uh, Ram Das, so many sages or you know elevated souls have been chanting the Lord's name, like we mentioned. But when they chanted the Lord's name, they just lost themselves and went into ecstasy. They went into bliss. It doesn't always happen with us. Right? It doesn't always happen. In fact, we are hardly, right? <laughs> so why? Why is it that we are not able to go into those raptures of ecstasy? I mean, exactly, and yeah. We, we were talking about this. Yeah, I mean someone like Tukaram said Vithala and he went into raptures of ecstasy. I say Vithala and nothing happens to me. <laughs> so is it Tukaram's greatness or Vithala's greatness? <laughs> so this was a question that was asked to Swami and you know Swami has his own way of answering. So beautifully Swami said, says for a diseased person, a person who's having fever, okay, who's having disease, you put gulab jamun into his mouth, will he be able to know the sweetness of gulab jamun? No. Is there a fault in gulab jamun? No. So gulab jamun continues to be sweet. There is a fault in your tongue because it's diseased. So don't blame the gulab jamun saying that the, you know, the Lord's name, don't blame the Lord's name. The Lord's name is equally sweet and powerful. So Swami says, when he gives the, the, you know, the counter to it, he says, so, in order to overcome this disease, you need to take aushadu, which is medicine. Guess what is the medicine to overcome this, this disease that we are having? The name only. The same name, which is actually Amritam, is actually aushadam in the beginning. And it cures us of this disease and eventually we will reach one point where the moment we have overcome the disease, the first time we say the name of Govinda, we will reach into raptures of ecstasy. So the same name becomes, which is an aushadam, becomes amritam. Now that is the, that's the beauty of the Lord's name. That's, that's wonderful. We are talking about Tukara, Virabai, all these people, they sang, but they sang alone. Why do we need to sing it together? Why Sankirtan? Why do we need to sing it in a group? See, there are many ways of attaining the Lord. Many paths of sadhana, we can do meditation, we can do some yajna, or uh, we can do pranayama, we can do yogasana. So many things are being told in our scriptures. But as Siddhartha said, the, the discount for Kali Yuga is Namasmarana. So we are, we have decided we are going to follow that path. Why do it together? For example, if your neighbor is meditating, or if your neighbor is doing Yogasana or Pranayama, that is not going to benefit me. What is going to benefit is some sort of sadhana in which I can get involved. And what is this? This is Sankirtan. Sankirtan is not just me singing alone. Me and taking the whole group along with me. So that is the importance of group singing, which is called Sankirtana. And also, you know, for example, suppose you have this journey of life. Let's do a par parallel with that, that you're traveling from, say, Delhi to Agra, right? And you're, you're going, in a, going in your car. You don't need to see Agra from when you start. You go with the faith that you will reach Agra. Yes, you don't see it when you start. And you have your headlights on and you're driving down the highway. And suddenly your headlights fail. What can you do? There's not much you can do. But if you're traveling in a convoy of cars, for sure somebody else's headlight will help you go ahead. Yeah. Right? Community singing is like that. I might not have the capability to lead myself, but if I'm with a group, definitely the group can take me along. Like, like a baby. Like a baby is trying to take its first few steps. The baby cannot do it on its own. It takes the support of the mother's hand. So similarly, when we are taking these baby steps into spiritual path to reach Swami, what do we have? We have the support of our brothers and sisters who become like our parents, holding our hands and taking us along. Because you are not singing alone. In this path, you have people with you who will take you around. You don't have, have to become conscious that you have to do it on your own. You have people taking you around, your first few baby steps. And also Swami gives a very, very beautiful analogy. He says, if you look at you know what is what is bothering the world today, it's pollution, right? And pollution, Swami says, is more more than the actual the carbon monoxide which is filling our atmosphere. It is the pollution of these negative vibrations. So to counter it, the only way to counter it is by filling it with positive vibrations. And what is the importance of positive vibrations? Swami gives a very scientific explanation for it. When we sing the name of the Lord aloud, okay, that vibration is becoming a part of the cloud. 
because we are leaving air that air is becoming a part of the cloud that cloud travels okay and you know beset with this positive vibration it gives rain that rain <coughs> results in the crop and that crop goes back into filling our bellies which give us the power to say the lord's name again so here is a positive cycle a virtuous cycle which we are creating because chanting of the lord's name especially the nagar sankirtan so just imagine what otherwise happens is if you sing anything else which is negative or think which is negative that negativity is becoming the cloud that negative cloud is going to give negative water that negative water is going to you know nourish your negative crop and that crop is going to come back to you so what you give you get so we have to so that is why swami says it's necessary to fill this atmosphere with that positive uh, vibration and what is more positive than the lord's name so that is another beautiful explanation that swami gives for why we should be doing this nava sankirtan there's another thing that swami has said as i may was saying something back when you fall into a well you are not chanting within your mind you are going to chant aloud so in a similar way swami so beautifully says that you chanting the name is like you lighting a lamp at the threshold of your house in the olden days when we didn't have the street lamps the lamp would be lit at the threshold in such a way that it lights the area outside the house and lights the area inside the house so what is the threshold swami draws a simile to the lips he says the lips are the threshold from where you chant god's name <laughs> so that is where the lamp is lit such that it lights your inside so the person who is chanting or singing it lights your inside and the people who are outside that is the people who are following it lights up their lives as well so this is the other advantage of community singing and having spoken so much about community singing sankirtanam we know we have like we mentioned before all of us are aware of the so many sages like mirabai and you know and tukaram and even in more recent times swami haridas so many of these sages and saints have been keeping this tradition alive the bhakti movement itself in a way it revived hindu spirituality the way of thinking and in a way the songs that they have composed their prayers all that all of those those energies culminated in the movement called the sai bhajan movement right because today if we see the sai bhajan movement is one of the most prominent movements we will talk about it but in a way all their prayers and all their songs and their vibrations has resulted in what we enjoy today as the sai bhajans okay let me just uh, ask you all have you heard of the sai olympics any of you have heard of sai olympics very interesting so let me tell you about the sai olympics let me introduce to you uh, someone told narrated this in front of bhagwan right? so I'll, i'll tell you uh um, in many ways the olympics can be compared to the sai movement in the world everybody has heard about olympics isn't it similarly everybody in this world has heard about bhagwan shri satya sai baba in fact there is no head of state in this world who doesn't know the existence of the satya sai organization and shri satya sai everybody knows but everybody is not interested in olympics similarly not everybody is interested in the sai movement unfortunate are those who are not interested okay amongst now all those people who are interested in the olympics not everybody gets a chance to see the olympics few people get a chance to see the olympics few people just follow it in newspapers and magazines etc similarly of all the people who are interested in the sai movement not everybody gets a chance to watch the sai movement out of all the people who are interested and who get a chance to see the olympics very few people actually get the ticket to get into the stadium isn't it similarly out of all the people who actually watch the sai movement very few people get the chance to enter the stadium and what is the stadium the satya sai seva organization is the stadium okay so in india this is india in fact it begins here <laughs> now out of all the people who enter into the stadium not everybody is an athlete right most of the 80 90% of the people are audience similarly in, even in satya sai organization no 90% of the people are audience they will come you know on uh, birthday functions halls will be full shivaratri bhajan hall will be full swami's birthday hall will be full etc akhand bhajan etc they just come watch they clap from far oh fantastic kya baat hai you know and they go okay but the most important people who make the olympics happen are the athletes 
Similarly, in the Sai organization, the most important people who make it happen are the Sai athletes. Now, amongst the Sai athletes, okay, amongst the Sai, there are two types of athletes. <laughs> One are the sprinters, 100 meters dash. You know, they are those people in the organization who will come for whatever time they are here, one, two months, maybe one, two years, they will be all over the place. You know, they will be like zipping, zooping and you will think that, my God, this guy is the ultimate person in the organization. Without him, organization cannot run. Within one year, he has disappeared. Burn okay. Burn away. Burn away, yes. And, and then you will see him, you know, for a Shivratri Bhajan. Hey, what's up, Arik? Why are you not coming today? No, man. Why is your office? You know, family is there. He'll give excuses, but you know, he'll be there, you'll see him off and like a flash in the pan. <laughs> so the second type of uh, the athletes are the marathon runners. <laughs> ten years back they were there in the organization, today they are there in the organization and you can bet that ten years from now they will be there in the organization. It is because of those marathon runners that the sign movement goes on. But even in these marathon runners, there are three types of marathon runners. <laughs> One are called the on-the-spot marathon runners. <coughs> they will be running on the spot. That is, 10 years back how they were, now how they are, and 10 years from now how they are is the same. No improvement, no deterioration also, which is fair enough, good. Yes. The second type of organ, uh, the marathon runners are the dangerous ones. They are the backward running marathon runners. <laughs> when they joined the organization, they were very good people. Now they are not so good. <laughs> More number of, you know, more amount of jealousy, more amount of hatred, more amount of, you know, this uh, one-up manship and, you know, these people are the people whom we have to pray, Swami, please then show them some other organization. <laughs> but, there are the forward running marathon runners. Okay, when they joined, they were, they just took their baby steps, as Bahia said. And when they will reach, they will, when they end, they end only in mergence with Bhagwan. They will merge with their founder. Now, the first thing we do know is the moment we hear this, we start looking around and say, you know what, he's the, he's the sprinter, he's this, he's that, you know, I'm this, that. I think the most important thing we need to do is ask ourselves, who are we? What do kind we of want? runners are we? What kind of runners are we? Do we, what kind of runners do we want to become? Obviously, I think each and every person over here is a forward running marathon runner. And that we have dedicated our lives to this. And just like the Olympics, there are different kinds of sports. There is swimming going on, there is boxing going on, there is the athletic, you know, the, similarly in the Sai organization, also several activities are going on, right? But the bhajans is the marquee, right? The, you know, the, the, the what happens in the stadium is the marquee events. Similarly, to me, actually, the Sai bhajans is like the brochure of the Sati Sai organization. <laughs> You know, when you want to introduce such a organization to someone, you give him a brochure, just go through this. In a snapshot, you get to know what the organization is. Because you go to any bhajan, at the end of the bhajan, they will introduce, uh, Aaj kal ki seva yaha pe hai, Mahila ki, you know, Mahila vibhag yaha pe milegi, Valvika's classes yaha pe hote hai, Narayan seva, all the other activities of the organization are being introduced to a, to a new person in the bhajans. That is the privacy of the Sai bhajans in the Sati Sai organization. Privacy of bhajans in the Sai organization. Like Amina is saying, and in the morning the auditor uh, president was also saying, that is the door as Jaya and Vijaya. The bhajan singers are the one who let people into the organization. That is the brochure. That is what gets people into this high organization. We have, when we were discussing in the last few days, we came across a few incidents which very beautifully portray this. There was this person who was fed up with life. He thought he needed to end his life. He went and sat on a bench on the shores of River Thames. And he said, Today is the day I am going to jump into the Thames and end my life. After sitting there for an entire day, in the evening, he said, okay, this is the moment I am going to get up. As he was about to get up, a voice told him, sit down. He was shocked. He sat down. He thought he was hearing things 
because he was really not doing well. So when you're not doing well, one of the things that happens is you have a lot of alcohol inside you. Your mind is not thinking clearly. So he thought, no, I'm hearing things because of that. See, he got the courage again, got up, jumped into the river. Now the, the voice, the same voice told him, sit down. This happened three times. And by now he thought, yes, I am not imagining. This is really happening to me. Somebody is asking me to sit down. He got up, finally he decided, okay, I'm not doing this, I'm going back home. On his way back home, he passed a house where he heard a very faint voice. Some, some voice was coming from that house. As he passed that house, he recognized that it was the same voice that had very sternly told him, sit down. So he wandered into that compound. And by then that voice had stopped talking and something melodious was coming out of that house. So he just went and sat there. He sat there for about half an hour, 45 minutes. Then this, this music stopped. Then a few people came to speak to him and asked him where, what, etc. And he explained the situation and then he said, what are you people, what are you doing? And they said, we are devotees of Satya Sai Baba and we just finished our Sai Bhajan session. And just before the bhajan session, these people would play excerpts from Swami's discourse. And that was the voice that this man heard, which had earlier told him, sit down. And that was the voice which had pulled him inside this compound. And then the, the bhajans that were going on after that, they just glued in there. And he said, the last 45 minutes of music that I heard, were the most magical moments of my life. So from that day onwards, every day the bhajans would happen in that house. He came there every day. He became the most regular attendee of this bhajan in this house. When there was this problem going on in former Yugoslavia, where the Serbians and Kosovians, they were having their war, the Sai devotees from UK had sent out truckloads of you know clothes and food and other things for the refugees there. And this man being a truck driver who had driven all around Europe, he was spearheading this entire moment. <laughs> From a person who was willing to give up his life, just imagine he was attracted by obviously Swami's voice first. And then those bhajans that he was hearing just got him glued to that center such that he attended that for months. And then he became such an ardent devotee, spearheading Swami's cause across countries in Europe. This is what, this is the magic that bhajans can actually do. This is the attracting power of bhajans. Yeah, coming back home actually, in fact, a very similar story that I heard a few days back. It seems when the super speciality hospital was started, uh, all the people, you know, were told that please send as many patients as you can to Prashantinilam, our Swami's hospital, etc. And it so happened that there was a big, long waiting list of, you know, people, patients in Puttaparthi. So this matter was taken to Swami, saying, Swami, you know, so many people are coming, but you are not able to, you know, cater to their medical needs. And Swami's answer, he, it seems one day he came out in his in the veranda. He was sit, standing in front of all the state presidents and the and the uh, conveners. Um, and he just he just said that, see, no need to bring those people over here. First thing you should tell them is the moment they, they come and say, you know, we have a heart problem or we have this problem, tell them, come for the Samiti Bhajans. <coughs> Swami said this, come for the Samiti Bhajans. So there was one gentleman who had heard this and uh, when he went back, uh, there was one particular uh, you know person who having a heart ailment who came over there and said, you know, I would like to use the services of our super speciality hospital. And he remembered what Swami said. He said, why don't you come for our Samiti bhajans? So this man started attending bhajans. And six months down the line, he was so attracted to Bhagwan and he was so attracted to bhajans that, you know, six months passed by and they were coming for their Parthi Yatra. Okay, and so he, this, uh, the, the, the gentleman who had heard Swami telling, he thought he will take up his matter, you know, when they go to Parthi. The week, the next week they were about to leave to Parthi. This gentleman comes back and tells him, Sir, you know, uh, actually you remember I had come with you, I had come to you with a problem. That problem has got solved. There is no need for me to, you know, come to Parthi for this. I will come to Parthi to do Seva. Okay, because some person out of the blue came forward to sponsor his entire operation 
wherever he was. So, in fact, you know, in many ways, there is no need for us to run to Prashanti Nilayam. We can bring Prashanti Nilayam to where we are. That is what Swami meant to say. When he said, just ask them to come for Samiti Bhajans. That is why, you know, that is the primacy of Bhajans. I was in class 10. I come from a family where Swami was just a part of our altar. We would make once a year a visit to Prashanti Nilayam. And when I was in class 10, I was the typical adolescent teen. Bunking school, bunking tuitions, big a big headache to my parents actually, and you know almost pushing them to disown me of sorts. But uh, and my mother was greatly worried about this, and I had a cousin of mine who had been a student in the Whitefield campus, and he had come home and it seemed like my mother had had told him because he's he's a little elder to me and my mother had told him why don't you sit him down and try to stuff some sense into this there, and he just came up to me and he gave me a cassette. And he said, just listen to this. So I said, what is it? He said, just listen to it. Then you tell me what you feel. And it was a collection of about 11 or 12 Prashant Nilayam Mandir Bhajans. From the first time I heard that cassette, I just started imitating the sounds that were coming out of the cassette. I don't come from a family of singers. I'm still not a singer. I sing. That's it. But then, I don't know what it was that was there in that cassette or what was the, the magic in that voice that was coming out of my stereo system. I was just hooked to it. And that was the moment that actually Swami hooked me. And I just felt that my life should not be the same. I just felt that I should not be the same. And one thing led to another and then I realized I, I was singing. And then someone out of the blue came and told me, why don't you come to the Samiti near your house? And then I started singing in the Samiti. And then within three years, I got an opportunity to sing in Sundaram and then I sang in front of Bhagwan. And one thing led to another, like I said, five years later, I was applying for Swami's college to do my MBA. And ten years later, eleven years later, Swami has lifted me to a level where he thinks I'm worthy enough to stand in front of you and speak to you. And I don't think, if it was not for the Sai Bhajans, if it was not for the power of Sai Bhajans, I'm not worthy of standing on this stage. So I think that that is the power of budget. Like we've heard these stories. I know I'm, I'm speaking out of from the heart. That, that's all I can say. That's just the magic of budgets. And going on to the uniqueness of Sai budgets. Sai budgets are a combination of multiple forms of kirtana, as Swami himself had categorized this in his discourse. And each of these categories of kirtana fits into the bhajan sankirtana that we all do. We'll quickly go through those, uh, these four forms. The first is called nama sankirtana. That is very simple. We all sing the glory of the name of the Lord. We'll just quickly give you examples of uh, what bhajans we have in each of these uh, types. For example, in nama sankirtana, Hari Om Namah Shiva Hari Om Namah Shiva Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om Namah Shiva The next is what Swami calls as Bhava Sankirtana. Nava Sankirtan Bhava. Bhava is where you know you pour out your emotions, your feelings. And even, even our Sai versions have several such versions. For example, uh, Tere Siva Prabhu Koi Nahi Hai Tujhiko Mera Prana Tujhiko Mera Prana Then the third form is Leela Sankirtan, where we praise the Lord for all the magical miracles or the Leelas that He has performed. And an example of this is uh, Brahma Nayaka Baba Parti Baba Chandar Suraj Tumne Bana Nadiyan Saakar Tumne Bana 
Swami says is Guna Kirtan, which is singing the attributes and the qualities of the Lord. Jaya, jaya. So all, whether it's Nama, Bhava, Leela or Gunakirtana, everything has a representation in our Sai Bhajans. That's the beauty of Sai Bhajans. You know what, it's, Sai Bhajans are not just limited to that. Sai Bhajans have a, another most beautiful uh, attribute to it and that is, it covers every single genre of music known to us. For example, you know, uh, the Carnatic style of music, that's a genre, right? Kasturi Right? It's a very Carnatic version. So our Sai versions has even that. Uh, then the, there is a Hindustani, Hindustani style for those who prefer that. Then you, we have the, even the western kind of, you know, uh, the chord sequence which is more chord based. For example, uh, and then we have the, the even the light kind of you know versions just like uh, probably you know our film songs that we have got very very light and then the final, final genre we want to touch upon is the ghazal kind of singing, with the soft, uh, light kind of singing. Madhava Mohan Shama Murari Radha Vallava Hridaya Vihari Madhava Mohan Shama Murari So, just imagine how beautiful our side was. It's almost like Swami saying, you sing whatever you want, just put my name in it. And it is worthy enough to be offering to me. Western, rap, rock, soft, you know, blues, do anything. Just associate it with my name. And it is worthy as an offering to me. It's almost like that. So, you know, covering all this, that's the uniqueness of Asai Vajans. That's how, how proud we should be that we are part of something which is epoch making. It is, it's probably the only time in history of mankind that we are a part of something so special, like the Sai Vajans. This, this morning, in fact, our India president was also saying that probably no other religious uh, sect or group or whatever had this variety. And we just gave you samples. I mean, one one version. I think there are hundreds of samples for each of these styles that we just mentioned. So again, coming back to this, the Sai Olympic that we were talking, all of us want to become the forward running marathon runner, right? The Lambi race ka goda, <laughs> right? Apne Bhagwan ka goda banna hai right? When he sang as as Krishna, when he is sitting on the chariot and is and we want to be those horses which, which uh, you know, which drive his chariot. So how do we become that, right? All of us want to know, how do we become this long distance marathon runner? For any marathon running or for that matter, for any exercise, we need three things. That is, three things are important. First thing is the preparation part, right? This, you have to prepare. Just one fine day, you cannot start running 40 kilometers. You have to prepare for it. So we will start with how to prepare to become this front running, forward running marathon runner. And in this preparation, because we are, it's a group singing, there are, there are two important preparations that we need to think about. One is the individual preparation and the other is the group preparation. Right? So let's look at what this, what is this individual preparation, uh, you know, which is all about. 
the most important probably the most important thing that for swami in individual preparation for bhajans is practice nothing beats practice you know and there are no shortcuts to success okay uh, you cannot become the lovely race ka ghoda you cannot become the marathon runner overnight okay you have to spend hours and hours in fact i reminded the importance that swami used to give to practice uh, on one occasion we used to actually practice before bhajans uh, in the evenings Uh, in in the hostel so it so happened that myself and one of my colleagues we had we had finished practice and by the time we reached mandir swami had already come into the bhajan hall so we were sitting behind uh, all the bhajan boys were seated over there and swami spoke for a little time and then he went back into the interview room and uh, when he came and the moment swami went back into the interview room we went forward and we sat in our position the moment swami came out hey abhi tu maya swami said kidhar tha abhi tak It's gone now, you know, because we were not there. Swami has caught us. The moment we, then we just got up and said, "Swami, we were practicing." I did, but you know, he said, "If you were practicing, nah, then no problem. You should practice." In fact, Swami used to always encourage singers, "Don't come there, sit and chit chat. Come just five minutes before bhajan. It's enough. If you are practicing elsewhere, you know that that is the importance that Swami used to give to practice." I remember another incident where uh, we were supposed to give a music program. a couple of days later and swami had blessed us with this uh, this great opportunity he would call us into the interview room uh, just a day or two days before and he would listen to us sing in the interview room i mean it's such a sweet thing swami would do you know we are going to sing for him only two days later but then because we are going to sing in front of a big crowd he would want everything is practiced well so he called us inside and uh, asked all of us to sing we sang our songs and one of these uh, brothers of mine Swami asked him to sing. He sang the bhajan. He sang about a full paragraph. And then Swami looked at him very lovingly and said, "Bangaru, uh, the uh, words बहुत अच्छा है. अभी tune बोलो." He was shocked. He thought he sang the song. And even this boy was perplexed. He sang it once again, a whole paragraph. Swami looked at him once again very lovingly. He said, "Bangaru, मैं बोला. Words बहुत अच्छा है. अभी tune बोलो." and by this time you know few of us were almost giggling <laughs> what's happening we were not understanding swami repeated this four times you won't believe it four times he made him sing that over and over again for us all the four times it seemed just the same he was singing the same tune the fifth time he sang it finally swami said ha ye acha hai to us our non discerning ears as it were it was just the same thing he was singing each time but then for swami After four times of his practicing that over and over again in front of him, finally Swami found the component inside which he said, "Yes, now it is a good song." So that is the number of times he wanted us to practice till he felt it was good. Uh, Ravi sir, I think that brother was very lucky that Swami made him practice only four times because the rule that Swami has given is you should practice every bhajan before you sing. 100 times i think that interview would have gone on till the day of the performance if you had been singing for 100 times but swami says the first 25 times when you practice a bhajan you get a mastery over the tune the lyrics and the meaning the basic melody of the song to get that it takes you 25 times of practice and swami says the next 25 times you practice is when you have technically mastered the song right you know all all that there is to know about the song and it is at this stage when you render it after you have practiced it 50 times when you render it is when people come and shabash and they just give you a pat on the back saying that was really nice because they they feel or rather they have they perceive your technical brilliance over the song right this is after 50 times of practice and then swami goes on to say the next 25 times when you practice you have mastered the song you are fully into the mood of the song you are fully into the every word of the song when you start singing the form of the lord is just standing in front of you you know swami says and then he says the the final punch the final 25 times when you sing it not just in front of you but in front of each and every person who has come the lord stands there. and at that moment no, nobody will come and say wah kya baat hai it will just be the silent tears in their eyes which will be their gratitude to bhagwan to have given them that darshan 100 times when we sing like that then we will be able to give that experience 
to not only ourselves but to each and every one who has come isn't that a fantastic feeling when someone else is singing in front of him there is god in front of me there is god there is only god that's the that's the time that, that's what swami said 100 times we have to practice what about that what to practice how to practice it and... yeah what to practice swami all, often used to say omkaram is the best kind of practice simply doing om om and in fact uh, jasraj ji also uh, when he had come pandit jasraj ji when he had come to the music college some of us had gone uh, and he said he said a very beautiful thing he said if you look at everything in this universe you know, everything is round all god god's creation nothing is square rhombus or tri- triangle or anything you know? everything is round purna because Puram comes in sphere. In, you know, no. Look, look at stars. Look at the sun. Look at the moon. Look at the earth. Everything is round. Similarly, the, there should be this uh, sphere, the spherity in your voice, and that spherity in the voice will come through Omkara practice. And in fact, Swami in Dhyana Vahini says he has even given how to practice this Omkara. कैसे करना है Omkara? He says uh, in 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 Dhyana Vahini he says the Omkara should be like the plane taking off, okay, and then coming in front of you and then going off. how it tapers off so you know something like uh, swami says all the three uh, alphabets a u and m should be there so if it is uh, something like this if you are able to do this omkara practice and that is why swami has given us 21 omkaras before in you know before suprabhatam to do He has given us this, this. We singers. He has given us already that. Uh, he has built it up into our routine, into our daily routine to do 21 times omkar. That is a very very good practice, as uh, Swami also has said. The other component is doing what we call the base practice. That is to develop the uh, lower tones of our voice. And its practice of the uh, base tones of our voice is very important because one thing one of the other big singers who had uh, visited Prashant Liam said. तुम तुम्हारा बेस प्रैक्टिस करो ऊपर का रेंज भी बढ़ेगा during the day that base practice is also very important and then uh, one of the other singers who had come to prashant liam had told us that we should practice singing of hari om on the same note he said for great improvement in shruti you sing hari om because it has pronunciation of all the vowels that is ha di o Mm. So if we are able to chant continuously, sing it continuously on a note, Hari Om. If we are able to do this continuously on Shruti, this will be a perfect uh, practice. And why? Because all these vowels come into our uh, bhajan singing. They are very important on our bhajan singing. Some examples, uh, like for E, for E, the vowel E, Hari, no. देवी भवानी जगत जननी मंगलकारिणी कारुण्य रूपिणी नारायणी देवी नारायणी सो दैट हरि रि यू नो दैट ई कम्स हेल्पफुल इन दिस और व्हाइल सिंगिंग ओ ओ मीन दैट नाउ राम हरे हरे राम बोलो अल्लाह साई बोलो मोना साई बोलो सो दैट ओ कंपोनेंट कम्स इनटू दिस एंड देन द द मानस भजरे गुरु चरणम सो दैट ओ कंपोनेंट ओ So all these components of practice, if we do, if we do Hari Om practice, it helps us in all our versions. To you know, help yourself if your voice is cracking, is to do jogging. So I mean that your your voice is cracking because you do not have proper breath control. You are not able to breathe properly. 
So in order to increase your stamina and breathing, Swami suggested that he go for jogging. And he, would, he very sincerely used to jog every day in the evening after bhajans. And believe it or not, it really, he did really get rid of that. Obviously, when Swami says it has to happen. And it really did, he did lose the, ha the habit of his voice cracking just by something like jogging. So basically, the, the importance of breath control. Why this importance of breath control no, is because breath is something very, very, very critical for bhajans. For example, you know, if you, if you, if you have to sing... Uh, Jaya Jaya Shankari, Jaya Parameshwari, Jaya Shiva Shankari Ma. Our oh, sometimes our tendency, no, is to sing Jaya Shiva Shankari Ma. Ah. Yeah. Get the point, right? It is meaningless. Shiva Shankari Ma. Ah. That ah doesn't mean anything actually. It is Jaya Shiva Shankari Ma which has to go. Right? So, unless we have that breath control, we will be, we will end up giving, uh, we will end up giving the wrong breath uh, intake. So, we have to know where to take the breath. Just to finish that line. So, in fact, if, if the line is long, Ideally, we would take breath at about 50% of the line is over. Govinda, Govinda, Gaye, Bhajo, Radhe, Gopal, Krishna, Gaye. Again, it should not be so evident that, you know, Govinda, Govinda, Gaye, Bhajo, Radhe. It should not make it that obvious also. It should be a very subtle. Right? So, it should be a quick, quick breath that we take. So, that is the importance of, especially for long lines. This breath control becomes very, very important in cyberspace. And talking about practice, a number of times to practice. Believe it or not, there was this one student, uh, Rupak Sharma, right? Yes, Rupak Sharma, sir. And uh, he had sung to Swami this Sai Bhajana Bina Sukhashanti name, which Swami used to sing after the discourse. And Swami liked that bhajan so much. Swami actually learnt this bhajan from that brother. And how did Swami learn this bhajan? He had instructed that this brother had to stand outside his room, outside the window, and sing the bhajan. He says, whenever you come and stand outside, you just sing the bhajan, so I can keep hearing it. And he would call him inside the interview room, and line by line, Swami has learned that bhajan from him. And not just that, Swami made him sing the bhajan during regular bhajans, so that Swami could get more practice of listening to the bhajan. It was only after that, that Swami started singing it himself. So see, when, you know, we talk about humility, but look at this, the Lord himself, who inspired that bhajan, does not want to sing it without adequate practice for himself. <laughs> what more example do we need for practicing a bhajan? In fact, even this morning also, our Malindi President Sir was saying, of, of the, you know, this concept of humility. Imagine the Lord from whom music has come. He is asking the person, keep singing, keep singing. And in fact, I have I've also heard that after Swami sang this Hari Bhajanavina for the first time, he went back and he asked this boy, Thik hai? <laughs> so that is the beauty of Swami. Swami has taught us what is humility. How humble we have to be when it comes to, you know, bhajans and picking up something. So humility is one more very, very important uh, ingredient in the preparation of a Sai, uh, you know, of a Sai singer, a bhajan singer. The, the other thing, you know, about this practice is one very beautiful thing that I had heard. If you want to dig, you know, if you want water and if you dig, uh, you know, uh, you, someone says that you get water at 100 feet, you have to dig in one place 100 feet. You can't dig in 100 places 1 feet, 1 feet, 1 feet, 1 feet and expect water to come. Similarly, when once you take up that one activity for practice, continuously do that. That consistency and intensity, you know, will help you go down that 100 feet. And, you know, the beauty of it is, even if you don't find water at 100 feet, don't worry, water will fall from top. And it will that is the grace of the Lord. And that is the grace which only He can give. And He will give this to you just like that. Because for Swami, just by tapping us, we will know music. In fact, there is one brother, uh, you know, who is a singer right now. He did not know how to catch Shruti when he came to Prashanti Nilayam. And surely through practice, he says, today I know how to catch Shruti. No, even catching Shruti, uh, be singing in Shruti itself is a great, great blessing and compassion of the Lord that you know has poured over us that we are able to even catch the Shruti. That's the beauty and of the And the onus is on us 
to capitulate on this grace that God has given. That yeah, when somebody puts some shruti, we are able to identify that. And the onus is on us that this blessing we take it forward through practice. I think the, the next component that we are going to come to in uh, individuals' preparation for bhajans is the selection of bhajans. See, typically in Prashantirilam, what happens is, uh, however good a singer might be outside the bhajan group, he might have learned music, but for the first time that he enters the bhajan group as a singer, every bhajan singer typically starts with a simple bhajan. So the most important thing is, we know and everybody who is going to follow us, they know that this is our ability. See, we should never select a bhajan which is above our ability. Through practice, of course, we improve our ability and according to that, we will select our bhajans. So typically, uh, boys in Prashantalim, they start with singing fast, small bhajans. And then once you are comfortable, you can sing uh, bigger bhajans or slower bhajans. And the other thing is about selecting the right scale, the right shruti on which you can sing. See, each of us is blessed with a different range in which we can sing. Some of us have a greater lower range, some of us can sing a higher range. But the most important thing is to identify, see, just because Siddhartha sings Giridhara Govinda Gopal in three pancham, I cannot sing that because I cannot sing as high as him. I think that innate uh, knowledge we should have that this is my limitation and this is my shruti, I will sing in this. Because either we sing too low, nobody is going to hear the word, or if we sing too high, we are going to crack our voice and no amount of jogging is going to help us. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, the third important aspect of uh, song selection is we should know the meaning of what we are going to sing. See, the, the importance of knowing the meaning we are going to come to a little later, but just that as part of preparation, we should know what is the meaning of the words that we are singing in a bhajan. For example, let me just uh, quickly, a small little quiz. Uh, what is the meaning of Niranjan? Niranjan? What is the meaning? Alak Niranjan Bhava Bhaya Vanjana Narayan You sing, right? What is the meaning of Niranjan? Anybody? Yeah, so the actual meaning of Niranjan is blemishless, spotless, which does not have any spot. And alak means a lakshana, the one which does not have any lakshana and the one who is... So we are praising that supreme you know, uh, attribute of the Lord which is blemishless. It's a, it's a word that we use so often but we don't know the meaning of you know, Niranjan. For example, what is the meaning of Janardhan? Janardhanananthalala So what is the meaning of Janardhan? Ah, in fact, yeah, someone said it, right? You know, the, the most beautiful meaning of, uh, two meanings of Janardhan. One is, the one who inflicts pain upon one who does evil. Okay, the one who punishes those who are doing evil, that is Janardhan. The other one is the bestower of boons. You know, the one who simply, who is Sulabha Prasanna Yenava, right, Swami's 107th name. Simply you can, so one who bestows boon, he is Janardhan. So these are all words which we use often, but we don't know their, you know, the meaning. The moment we know the meaning, how much more, you know, significance we, are, we will be able to attach to that singing. Let us say there is, you know, we need some boon in our life. The moment we say Janardhan, we are, we are praying to that, you know, kind of. So that's the importance of knowing the meaning. In fact, uh, <laughs> there are a few funny stories. We have, you know, when you don't know the meaning, what will happen? You know, for example, there is this bhajan. Anjananda veeram Ashokavana sancharam This is on Hanuman. Vande Lanka Bhayankaram Sita Ashoka Vinashakaram Right? So there was this, you know, in one Samiti I heard Vande Lanka Bhayankaram Sai Bhayankaram Sai Bhayankaram He is saying, Sai Bhayankaram 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 just because it makes musical sense, yeah, does not have to make sense. So it's in Shruti, it's in Tal, fantastic voice, awesome singing, but he's singing Sai Bhayankaram. <laughs> One more story, Amit. Of this, this, you know, point of not knowing the meaning of what you're singing. It ended the bhajan career of a student with one bhajan, in his first bhajan. Okay? The bhajan was Jayananda Lala Jay Jay Gopala. So he's singing the next line in front of Swami. 
मोहन मूरख भजन The basic thing is after the Ganesh bhajan gets over, we start with bhajans that are in a slow tempo, and then move on to bhajans. If you have a half an hour bhajan, probably after 20 minutes we have bhajans that really go fast in tempo. 45 minutes, the last 10-15 minutes fast tempo. The whole idea is in the beginning everybody gets into the mood of the bhajan, everybody gets involved in the bhajan, and that mood is sunk in, and then you take off. Then you know the bhajans move into a crescendo, and you end in that crescendo on a high note. So that is one thing that we uh, follow. So typically, you wouldn't find a Guru Baba Guru. It will never be the second bhajan. It will be towards the end. At the same time, at the end, you will not have something like just imagine after you know spending 45 minutes there. Bhana Sha Putta Parthi Purisha. Just bring down. You know the tempo. Is up there. So it should build in a crescendo. That's one thing that we follow in Prashantinath. Of course, the second rule that we follow is after the Ganesh Bhajan, yes, uh, we typically don't repeat the same deity one after the other. If the second Bhajan is a Krishna Bhajan, the third is usually not a Krishna Bhajan. Krishna Bhajan will probably come again sixth or seventh. So we try to not sing the same deity one after the other. We try to leave. Because Swami was very critical about it that there should not be two Krishna Bhajans consecutively, no two Shiva Bhajans. So, so you, we have almost like something like ten deities. You know, Guru, Devi, Shiva, Rama, Krishna, Vithala, Narayana, Sarva Dharma, Sai. So all this can come, you know, uh, here and there. So you could have, as he said, you know, Rama Bhajan, not two consecutive Rama Bhajan. So two, no repetition of God. And the other thing is different beats. Try to have different beats in the uh, in the playlist that we are having. For example, every Bhajan in eight beat will not be good. So you could have, you know, in different beats. For example, Bolo Narayana, Jai Jai Vithala. Or then you could have Sharade Jai Sharade Vavira Sini Sharade in 7th beat. Or you could have Shri Venkatesha Saveshwara in 5th beat. So you could have 5, 8, 6, you know, different type of beats also should be there. That's what we, again Swami, Swami used to enjoy, you know, when the beat used to change, Swami will enjoy that. He'll put uh, the talam in, in that way. So that's how. And the same thing comes down to ragas also. So, ragas, uh, not not very technically the same raga, like we are talking about um, Todi, we don't mean Todi, but the feel of the, you know, there are some some bhajans which sound a little melancholy, maybe they have a lot of more of bhava, that melancholy bhava in it. So, we should not have similar bhajans, you know, one after the other. Yeah, I mean, just imagine if, if bhajans would be something like this. Prathama Vandana thing that Swami used to always, you know, talk about these two words, buzzwords were Samayam and Sandarbham. Choose a bhajan according to Samayam and that is time and circumstance. <coughs> very, very important. You know, for example, uh, if uh, some Narayan Seva would be going on, okay, and we would sing something like Din uh, se <laughs> You know, these are the so you, you have to see the circumstance and sing that kind of bhajan because that will lift the entire crowd. Uh, I'm I'm reminded of 
you know, of when, when something wouldn't... For example, there was one uh, Krishna Jarmashtami function. Uh, and uh, all the boys were sitting and Swami was asking, okay, just sing, sing all the songs that you are going to sing. Swami was again, you know, in the interview room he was. So there was one fantastic singer who was going to sing this, this song. Chalti chakki dekh kar Diya kabira roe Do paathal ke bich me Sabit bacha na koi Do din ka jag me le da sam Chala chali ka kera such a beautiful song, isn't it? But Swami just said, Swami listened to the whole song and he simply said, Tomorrow is Krishna Janmashtami. <laughs> it's, a, it's a celebration of the birth of the Lord. Why are you singing that kind of, you know? Sab, you know, chala chali ka khela, you peace gaya, tu kya tera, you know, mera haar kya ho gaya. See, that is the sandarbha, the circumstance. I heard the bhajan a lot. And uh, the crowd was lost in the bhajan, so all of me, it was such a joyous occasion seeing you know, the beautiful form of Swami sitting in front of us and we were lost and enjoying it. Swami also enjoyed that. Taking this same example in the next year, I thought, okay, this is the time to make Swami happy once again, just the way I did last year. <laughs> I sang this bhajan. And Swami was sitting there and I sang and the words go, Tere janam din mein pehen bhai. I had sung the same bhajan, the whole bhajan, the previous year and Swami was very happy. This year, the moment I, I thought when I started the song, I said there was something wrong. Swami was looking at me in this rather odd way and that odd way became definitely a glare. By the time I reached this line saying, Tere jan, aye, bichhade, behana, or bhai. And he was glaring at me and when I thought, when I took the courage to sing it a second time, he said, stop it. He glared and he said, stop. He said, think something else. From the stage, we were sitting right so immediately changed to some Guru Baba or some Govinda Narayan and everything was hunky-dory after that. Everything, the bhajan session went on fine. But then I, I never understood what happened. I mean, just a year ago, Swami enjoyed this bhajan so much. And why this reaction now? It is afterwards that I realized that in the crowds that had assembled for Swami's bhajan, there was a huge contingent of devotees who had come from rural Andhra Pradesh. There were a few thousands of these devotees who were sitting in the crowd and they had no clue what is Tere Janam Din Me Sai Aaye Pichade Behan Bhai They had no clue what is happening So you know Swami said the whole idea of bhajan is to involve everybody and on such a happy occasion Swami felt what is this? Nobody, there was silence I'm sure in that entire area there was silence and that was not something that Swami wanted So that was another example how Swami wanted you know Samayam and Sandarbham we need to take care of of course, another thing with regards to group preparation is uh, encouraging newcomers. And that's something that all of us have experienced with, with Swami, as well as with our seniors in the group, like Amaya, who's my senior, Ravi sir is all our senior for most of us. And I'm sure if you ask Ravi sir, he would say the same thing. His seniors also encouraged him in the sense that, you know, this person has just joined the group. You know that, you know, he's an aspiring singer, he's a good singer. So you give him the motivation, you give him the opportunities, the chances for him to improve and that is something that Swami also used to do because batch after batch every year there would be a new bunch of singers and when we were discussing we, we, we realized that you know the average age of the Prashanti Mandir Bhajan group is never above 25-26 it's always 25-26 because you know every year you have youngsters coming in and Swami would always pick these youngsters and encourage them to sing it's like to you know correlate to what Amay was saying with regards to the Olympics it's the passing of the baton in a relay race that you, you should know that you should build the trust with your teammates in a relay race and you pass the baton on to the next group. And you stay on and you make sure that they come up to the levels that have been established for your bhajan group. And I think at this point I, or, I would also like to say, you know, someone like Ravi Bhaiya, so senior, I mean such a fantastic singer, always encouraged us as, as you know youngsters, would come and pat us and say, today the bhajan was nice, you know, or something like that. Always these words of encouragement. And you know, if he would get three bhajans to sing, he would say, ah, nahin, tu, tu ga, tu ga abhi, main You know, he would always, he would always do this. So we would wonder, you know, someone like Ravi Bhaiya, who is such a good singer, he would always was ready to give up his chance, you know, for the sake of youngsters, so that youngsters can come up. 
So I think that's one very important thing in this group preparation because we have to take everyone along. We just cannot be, you know, holding everything, uh, you know, with, with ourselves. So uh, when I was part of the Brindavan Seva, then uh, we used to have a few of our uh, aunties who used to, you know, sing in the ladies' side. They were all some of the who's who of Swami's, you know, Brindavan days. Fantastic singers, so many composers of so many bhajans that we we keep singing to this day. But you know, as age caught up with them, obviously there was a little bit of shaking in their voice, and so it so happened that you know Swami had come to Brindavan on one occasion, I think 2001, and uh, he heard you know all these singers, and he was not very happy, and uh, so he just commented saying that bhajan uh, are bhajans are not fine, and you know immediately sweeping changes were made. You know, all these uh, aunties were asked to kind of step back and things like that. And so, you know, they were some of the closest devotees of Bhagwan. Uh, I mean, just to mention, Anita Saradam Nasti, the book, the author of that book, Vijayama Garu, she was one of them. You can imagine that kind of, you know, uh, closeness. So they promptly, the moment Swami came back to Prashanti Nilayam, they came, all of them came to Prashanti Nilayam. And, you know, seeing them all sitting over there, Swami immediately called them for an interview. And this is what I heard from one of the persons in the interview. They are telling, Swami, why have you stopped us from singing in front of you? No, we want to sing. And Swami is trying to explain. Swami is trying to explain, Bangaru, those days are over. Remember, only I and you used to be there in Vrindavan. Now thousands of devotees are coming to Vrindavan. You know, it's very important that, you know, youngsters be given chance and, you know, you go in your altar, you sing, I am there in your altar. You go to a corner of Vrindavan and, and under the tree you sit, I will appear in front of you. <laughs> I mean, I was actually shocked and in spite of that, these aunties kept saying, Oh, Swami, we want to sing in front of you. How they can take our chance from us? No. And ultimately, you know, they, they had to negotiate with Swami and finally Swami agreed that on Sunday evenings they can sing. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say over here is, you know, Swami himself, the same set of people who have made him so happy, he is giving an assurance that you sing wherever you are and I will appear in front of you. Right? That is, what more do we want than that? Right? That, that is the whole idea we are doing bhajans for. for. Now, wherever we are doing, if we are able to manifest Swami there in front of us, that is the most magical moment, I think. They know the chance that we need, isn't it? Yeah. Chance, like one of one of my seniors, in fact, I remember in the bhajan hall, uh, he was saying when somebody went up to him and said that, uh, sir, it's a chance for me to sing, it's a chance. So, this senior very sincerely told him, see, one chance for you should not become an agony for thousands of others outside. <laughs> that should not be the case. So, see, at the same time, while the seniors were very encouraging, it was not blind encouragement. See, Swami would, every student had to ask Swami permission to sing. And then Swami would say, yes, Bangaru, but, you know, there were one or two persons who were in charge of the bhajan group, he will say, go and sing in front of them. So, it is not a blanket permission. So you have to say, when at the same time when Swami was very encouraging of new singers, he ensured that there was quality before they actually came and sang in the mandal. So, so much about all the preparation that we have. Now we have come to the final race. You know, we are in the stadium and we are about to, you know, uh, the final race is going to begin. And, you know, that is the delivery, the actual delivery. So after all our years and years, hundred times practice, etc, etc, Hari Om, Om, all those things, we finally come to the delivery. So, what are the things that Swami has told about this, this delivery, the final thing in the vision? I think the most, the primary, most important aspect in singing is Shruti. Being able to sing on Shruti. And I think that is the most difficult aspect of singing as well, to be able to sing on Shruti. In fact, uh, once one of the great singers who came to Puttaparthi, he was telling me that in all the aspects of sing singing that you would have, you will have, you know, your uh, khatkas and your murkis and you are able to sing, you know, light songs, this song, that song. You put all that on one side of a tarazu, one side of a weighing scale and on the other side of the weighing scale, there is just so. You know, if you have 20 components of singing, you put 19 on one side, on the other side, there is so. So, it is that much import, uh, important that is laid to so. And your Swami also would lay so much importance to this. It doesn't matter for Swami if you are singing a complicated bhajan or a simple bhajan. If you are singing a bhajan out of Shruti, Swami will glare at you then and there and say, Hey, Apa Shruti. In the middle of the bhajan, He will make you correct. Concentrate. Concentrate on that. So, so that is the 
primordial, the most important aspect of singing is soul. Another, I think, very important uh, aspect of singing, uh, you know, in the bhajan, is to know the speed, the intrinsic or the native speed of a bhajan. Uh, some bhajans, all bhajans cannot be sung in all the speeds. Some bhajans can be sung in some, for example, um, Jaya Ma, Jaya Ma, Jagadishwari Sai Ma, Jagadishwari Maheshwari Sai Shwari Sai Ma. Now the same bhajan, if I have to sing, if I start, for example, Jaya Ma, Jaya Ma, Jagadishwari Sai Ma. Jagadishwari Maheshwari It's the same matter, right? It's not something good. Because there is a native speed which is involved with every bhajan. So that, to know the native speed of the bhajan is very very important. So that you'll be able to give all the kamakas. There is one more aspect in singing. When you are talking about speed, you select a fast bhajan. You are singing that bhajan according to where it should be. But then there is a second speed for the fast bhajan. So suppose in the first speed you are able to give certain what we call turnings, you don't have to replicate it in the second speed. I'll just give you an example. Jaya Jagajanani Ma Jaya Ma Jaya Ma Jaya Ma This we are giving in the slow speed. The whole turning sounded very nice. Ma able to give it. But the same thing in the second bit. Jaya Ma, Jaya Ma. You know, it, you are able to give it. Some people are able to give, some people may not be able to give. But then the beauty and you are distracting people away when you are doing this. So you can simplify that part and say Jaya Ma, Jaya Ma, Jaya Ma. You know, you retain the beauty, you retain the prayer aspect of the bhajan. There are some bhajans which the speed picks up in the middle of the bhajan. For example, we start the second speed and then during the somewhere in the middle of the second speed the, the bhajan picks up. For example, Rama Sumira Mane, Rama Sumira Mane, Rama Chandra Shri Ram, Bhajamana Sita Ram Ram, Bhajamana Sita Ram. If you pick it up too much, Bhajamana Sita Ram Ram, Bhajamana Sita Ram, Bhajamana You start struggling to even, you know, pronounce each of the individual vowels. So the bhajans which pick up in the middle, you should have a conscious idea of how much you should allow the bhajan to speed up. Especially these kind of bhajans. Then, then the other aspect of bhajan singing, I think is modulation. Uh, how much to modulate? You know, a bhajan could be in shruti, it could be in tala, it could be, you know, for example, uh, a, you know, a bhajan like this. Daya karo Sorry for the no perfect perfect shruti perfect you you tell me what is wrong yeah but does it sound good there's nothing wrong with the person same thing if I'm able to sing right I'm just modulated my voice. No, so this modulation also is so important. Again, every bhajan you should not sing like this. For example, if there is some bhajan like Sai Hamara Hamsa, then you cannot say Oh, this is over modulation. There you need that punch. Where you need to give punch, where you don't need the punch is what you need to. So that voice modulation is important. Another aspect in singing is Yeah, you are a trained singer. So I, I can do a lot of things in the bhajan. But then bhajan, as we know it, is for people to follow. See, Sankirtana is where we have pe people following us. So we are not giving a performance. So for example, a bhajan like this, no? Hari gun gana karo man nero Sa Enjoy this. 
साई गुण गान करो मन मेरो साई गुण गान दिस वे यू नॉट डिस्ट्रैक्टिंग यूर साई गुण यू नो डूइंग टू मच आई मीन फॉर अ भजन विच पीपल आर गोइंग टू फॉलो दिस मच इज नॉट नेसेसरी फॉर एग्जाम्पल यू नो विश्वनाथ हे गौरीनाथ हे साईनाथ भगवान दया करो दया करो दया करो भगवान हेर आर बिगिंग फॉर दया आई एम लाइक अ बिगर हु इज गॉन इन फ्रंट ऑफ अ In front of my Lord, with a picking bow, saying, "Bhagwan, must be daya kar." Now imagine, I go, daya kar, daya. It's like you know, I'm going, I'm a beggar, I'm going with a posh bow. Bhagwan, daya kar. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the. Kafi actually, actually, I'm a big man. Daya kar. Look, my, 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 my begging style is also so professional. It doesn't sound good. You no? are asking for mercy of the Lord, so we should know how much to give. In it will sound good musically, but the bhava aspect is not good. So that's that's the other thing about modulation. The yeah the uh, the other thing is the emphasis on the words. You know, different versions will have different words, uh, and I think we have to be very very careful of of how to emphasize. on the right words and how not to emphasize on the wrong words this so here are a few examples of uh, you know how not to emphasize on the wrong words for example raghav sundar ramar ghubar right in this ravan mardana vigna bhan Our second line will be Ravana Mardana. Where are we giving emphasis on Ravan? The budget is on Rama, and we are giving Ravana Mardana. So there, Swami, you know, stopped and he says, "Hey, Ravan." So it should be Ravana Mardana, Ravana Mardana, Vegna Bhanjana. See again, the wrong word. You know, we are emphasizing on the wrong word. The In the very same version, there is another example where Swami has stopped boys when they are saying, "Ravana Mardana Vigna Ban." Swami asks, "What is Vigna?" Then it is Vigna Banjana. Vigna is obstacle. Ravana Mardana Vigna Banjana. Vigna Banjana. Another again, uh, another version. Pannagashayana. Line comes. Apavinashak, buddhi pradayak, apavinashak. Some people give buddhi pradayak, apavinashak. Why are we endearing the word papa? No, we are not giving any importance to that word. Just like Ravana, papa is not a good word. So we, so we are saying if we are very aware of the words and their meaning. we will not give such emphasis on these words for that we also know to, uh, need to know the meaning of the bhajan the words so that we know what word to give the modulation after the modulation part of it the next important component is participating in the chorus very often what happens is the lead singers you know after they finish their bhajan they push the mic back and they want to give their voice a little bit of rest but you know swami has remarked that on so many occasions i think in 1989 no sir in 1989 swami had given a discourse in the hostel Where he said, "Why do boys after they finish their bhajan, they just push their mic back and they put their head down? Why is that? Boys should sing along. You should be a part of the chorus as well. Most of us feel, you know, we 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 don't want to sing in the chorus because we want to preserve our voice. But you know, the kinti is not enough. And also, Swami also mentioned in that discourse that not only should you follow, you should also clap. And again, an uh, analogy that Swami only Swami can give. He says that. When you clap, it's like when you have a lot of birds sitting on a tree. They're making a lot of noise. They're chirping. You go underneath the tree and you clap loudly. 
the birds will disperse, they fly away. So Swami says, like that in the tree of your mind, you have so many bad thoughts as birds which come and sit. And during bhajans, if you involve yourself, if you lose yourself in bhajans clapping, those birds will fly away, those bad thoughts will fly away. So it's very important that as a group, you should participate in the chorus as well, especially the lead singers. And especially when we have one hour bhajans, in fact, if one hour, if a singer is not able to sing, that means his riyas is not enough, his practice is not enough. Right? We cannot be preserving our voice for one hour of bhajan. If you are having an akhanda bhajan, yes, 24 hours I cannot sing, 12 hours I cannot sing. But one hour, 45 minutes, half an hour, we definitely should be able to sing every bhajan, you know, full-throated. And in fact, if, if we do that, this half an hour, 45 minutes becomes extra amount of riyas for us. You know, that, that is going to add in keeping our voice in shape. The other aspect is the talam, the talam, you know, the dhridhan that we put. And Swami kind of says, it inculcates this concept of discipline in our singing. You know, just like we need discipline in any activity that we do, this tala is giving us a discipline. Uh, so that is also very, very important uh, when it comes to uh, singing. Yeah. Just as we were mentioning, that a singer is not, uh, you know, having a performance, he's not making a performance. So similarly, the percussionist is accompanying the singer. You know, so if you have a tabla player who is a very accomplished tabla player, he is not giving a solo performance here. The idea of a percussionist is, as uh, I don't know, Brother Sham, he is a wonderful uh, you know, accompanying player in tabla. So the thing is, the whole idea is that we do not distract the people from the uh, from the course of the bhajan. So we will we'll just give you some examples of how you know percussion can actually distract the mind, disturb the mind away from the piece of the bhajan. Purteshwari Jaga Janani Jaya 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 Sahi Janani Jaya 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 Sahi Janani Purteshwari Jaga Janani Did anyone hear what the you know, tune was all about? No. And we were totally distracted because he was giving a performance on the tabla. Exactly. I mean, again here, no, see the feel of this, this bhajan. The bhajan is we are crying out. Jaya 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 and this tablist is busy showing off, you know, uh, what all he can do on, on the tabla. So the, the percussionist should accompany the singer, he should get into the feel of the bhajan. Yeah. So similarly, we are not saying, see, obviously, see, every bhajan is not sung in a very plain way as uh, Amir was just you know, showing some time back. We can give some small modulations in the bhajan. So similarly, a percussionist obviously has, you know, some, uh, some of these things, you know, variations that he gives will add beauty to the bhajan. For example, a similar bhajan. Sai Ram, Ganesha, Bhagavan, Tumhara Tum din koi nahi rakhe wale, Tum din koi nahi apasare, Tum See, the words are very simple, Sai Ram Tumhara Nam, and the accompanying whatever variations he is giving is only adding to the beauty, they are just taking Swami's words you know, ahead. He could also play something as simple. Of, you know, that uh, 
when when you're singing that, as if you're rowing in a boat. Jaya Kausalya Nanda. So again, this is the adds percussion. Beauty. Yeah, it just adds beauty. Mm. So it's very important that the percussion you should get into the mood of the song and you know, kind of sing along. Aspect of bhajans, which is bhava, right? And uh, Swami says that you have different types of garlands. You have some which are made of roses, some which are made of marigold, lotus. So many different types of garlands that you can make. Swami says that you know these ragas and talas are like the different flowers that you have. But a garland cannot stand without the thread. Those flowers cannot be a garland without the thread. And bhava is that thread that holds all these together. So you can know all these ragas, you can have these different talas, but if you don't express it without bhava, if you don't express it with bhava, then what happens is that your garland isn't complete. It, the flowers are just loose flowers. You're not able to offer a complete garland to song. So that is the stress that Swami places on bhava. And as a, as a corollary, you can't offer just a thread to Swami. <laughs> you know? So, bhava alone, without raga and tala, is not musical enough for God. And as Siddhartha was saying, uh, just the flowers don't make the beautiful garland that you want to offer at His feet. So it is a combination of raga, bhava and tala. And I think one of the most beautiful ways of building bhava into a bhajan is by forming a story. You know, uh, if we can go along with the mood of the bhajan and we can form a story along with the, with, with the bhajan, I think it will have tremendous impact. Let me give you a little example over here. Uh, so here is, I'm, I'm building the story for a particular bhajan and then we will sing the bhajan and we will go through that. We will go through this whole exercise. Imagine, just rewind yourself back into the days of Krishna. Okay. And Krishna is a little boy and all of us are gopis and gopalas around Krishna. Okay. And what, what was our pastime? Favorite pastime, get up in the morning, go with Krishna and play with him. Right? So all of us have played with Krishna, we have enjoyed our whole day with Krishna and you know finally we are, we are all tired, Krishna is also tired, we find a big beautiful tree okay, and we are lying down under that, uh, under, that, uh, under that tree and Krishna is lying right next to us and that's when you know it hits, oh my god, who is sleeping next to me? It's my, it's my Kanaya, it's my Sai who is sitting next to me, who is sleeping next to me. How can I allow this opportunity to go? You know, I just played with him, but I know who he is. You know, and at that moment, just imagine it's a cool breeze moving, and you just start, you just call out, you know, to to Krishna. So it's almost like saying. Ekaniya, Ekaniya, Sa Ekaniya, Sa Ekaniya. And Krishna responds, Kya re kya chiye? Paritro meri jibaniya. We are praying, we are praying to our Kaniya, Are paar laga do yaar. And then, then he says, Lekin I will not be with you all the time. Abhi toh hum log khel rahe hai, lekin toh shaam ko aapne ghar jayega, phir kya hoga? Phir mein kaisi tera beda paar laga hoon? And to which, mein kyun karo, mein kyun karo? And to which, you know, your response to Krishna, to Kanaya is, Tum ho mere maa baap bhaiya Ki you are only my mom, you are only my dad, you are only my bhai bandhu, Mujhe aar dusra koi nahi hai, Bas aap hi paar laga sakte ho. So he said, but lekin ek time to aega ki mein nahi rohunga, I will not be with you, then what about that? And at that time we say, Hridaya Nivasi Krishna Kanhaiya Yare, aap kaha ja sakte ho? Mene Hridaya mein tum aap hi bethe ho, aur koi nahi ho sakte ho. Hridaya Nivasi Sai Kanhaiya अच्छा तो फिर बोल क्या 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 बोल रहा था क्या चाहिए तुझे पार करो मेरी जीवन नैया very very important and very powerful technique is if you cannot if you cannot make a story 
you can definitely definitely visualize you know and i think that is where our bhagwan again has been so compassionate on us that we have been able to capture every mood of bhagwan every mood of swami so here is another uh, little uh, example that we will show you on how visualization can be a very powerful technique kalyan krishna tamaniya krishna ಕಾಲೀಯಮದನ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಗೋವರ್ಧನ ಗಿರಿಧಾರಿ ಮುರಾರಿ ಗೋಪಿ ಮಲ ಸಂಚಾರಿ ಮುರಾರಿ ಗೋಪಿ ಮಲ murari gopi mana sanchari vrindavan ki tulsi mala pitambar dhari murari pitambar dhari how would you sing your this bhajan if you knew that this was your last bhajan we don't know which is our last bhajan because we come to our center one week to the next week from this thursday to next thursday we don't know what lies in store for us the next thursday not being negative but then we should not take it for granted also isn't it so if you know that you might not get another opportunity to sing to swami how would you sing or if you're singing the first time in front of swami would you not give your best would you not give everything that you have so if you sing every bhajan with that kind of a feel that kind of a zeal i think that is another way by which you can bring that that latent bhava within it, within us and offer it to swami another very powerful technique that swami had told was that you know a singer can become a sinner or a saint if the singer is able to take the devotee to the lord he becomes a saint if he becomes a bada if he becomes an obstacle between the devotee and the lord he becomes a sinner he says because when a singer is singing there are thousands or hundreds sitting behind not everybody is able to pour out their feelings to the lord so when we for example when we sing daya karo shiva ganga dhari there may be someone out there who is wanting to pour out his prayers to the lord he is using this medium he is using you to convey his prayers to transport his prayers to the lord you have to become like a pipe a uh, conduit through which his prayers will reach to the lord now imagine if that pipe is contaminated with our own ill feelings then we are we are you know giving we are offering the lord a contaminated prayer so for that our pipe our conduit must be as clean as possible like a flute it's absolutely hollow only when it is hollow can it breathe out that beautiful music you know that has to reach so swami said in fact it's a great responsibility and that is why swami has you know called our organization as shri satya sai seva organization because even bhajan singing can be seva the bhajan singing in fact in fact is the seva because it is transporting someone's prayers to the lord what bigger seva can we do so even if we are not having pain we should have the ability to take someone else's prayers and offer it to the lord that is a, the great responsibility so even if we have that feeling and we sit in the bhajan saying swami make me that flute which can transport someone else's prayers to you and let it be in the most pristine way the way he is trying to pray to you that is one more way of bringing bhava in the singing to be devoid of contamination for a singer and uh, one of the few things which could contaminate that pipe of of a singer is the lack of humility it's a very interesting uh, story which once happened one of our senior brothers who was a mandir bhajan singer he was seated in front when one day swami was delivering his discourse and after the discourse as is usual want swami started a bhajan and somewhere in between swami apparently forgot the lyrics of the bhajan so he is looking at this singer and trying to indicate to him what is the next line he, <laughs> he didn't catch it and swami singing the same line over and again till he managed to convey that to him and once this 
this brother understood what Swami wants, he immediately prompted to Swami the next time. And Swami immediately caught on to that and he completed the bhajan. It seems after the bhajan, Swami looked at him nicely, smiled, gave him an abhyastha and Swami retired. The next occasion in which Swami was giving a discourse, this brother was seated in front and the same thing happened. Again, Swami apparently forgot the lyrics. Swami looked at this brother and he was alert this time. He immediately prompted Swami. And again, Swami gave him a nice big smile after the discourse was over. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for saving me. <laughs> this happened a third time. And the third time also this brother did this. And I said, what? You said you're going to sing it today? You don't know it. How are you going to sing it today? Swami, I'm not even going to remember. Okay, what did you say yesterday? Swami, yesterday? <laughs> what, you don't remember what you sang yesterday? Swami knows not. Sing some bhajan. You was Can completely you believe blank. This boy was not able to recollect a single bhajan. Okay, the one who prompted God. Not able to recollect a single bhajan. And at that time Swami said, Kya re? You thought I had forgotten those, those occasions. And then Swami said, If I forget, the universe will come to a standstill. Don't, this is only chance which I am doing. It's a, it's a way to create a relationship with someone. And that is, you know, that is the, that is the kind of humility we should have. At no point of time let us feel that, you know, we are above the Lord. <laughs> you know? There was an occasion where uh, Swami told one of the younger singers, no? Yes. He said, if you have ego, he told one of my classmates when we were in primary school, he said, good singer, I will lift you like this as you are singing nicely. Ego aata hai, either se drop karta hai. I will not leave you back like this. I will drop you from here. Tumara awaj le le I will take your voice. You know, that is the power, that is whom we are dealing with. Let us not be under any, you know, wrong illusions. illusions. We are dealing with the supreme master. In fact, here I would just like to narrate a quick incident of mine. <laughs> you know, an ego buster to some extent. Uh, when I was in my second year post-graduation, we were hardly three singers in the mandir. You know, in the sense, uh, 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 kind of singing regularly and you know that feeling you know I bhajan singer, hum log hai, pura, you know all the scholar had gone up uh, you know and uh, that ego obviously so Swami wanted to bust it one day I was singing the 8th bhajan after the 7th bhajan Swami got up to take arti which was a quite, quite a common uh, phenomenon the next day I was slotted to sing the 7th bhajan after 6th bhajan Swami took arti the next day I was slotted at the 6th bhajan. Uh, After 5th bhajan, Swami took Arati. Now generally when such a thing happens, we have one of our bhajan coordinators who will be very keenly looking. His antenna is very sharp. He will be seeing all this, what's happening, correlation and all that. So I thought, my god, three days it has happened, I have not sung. You know, better go off from Patli Gali. You know, I have not face uh, our bhajan coordinator because he will surely say something to me. But our eyes happened to meet and he smiled at me, I also smiled at him and you know, I left. The next day, dear brothers and sisters, you will not believe, I was started to sing the first bhajan, Ganesha bhajan. And I was thinking, Swami, abhi kaha jao gaya? Bhajan has to happen. If the bhajan will be there, then you will have to listen to my voice. And where can you go? Okay, and so I was, you know, very confidently, you know, uh, seated to sing, started to sing the first bhajan. Can you believe what happens that day? Swami calls four speakers to speak. <laughs> Each speaker speaks for about 20-25 minutes. Two hours have gone. Okay, and I'm thinking, oh my god, it's already 5.30 now, Swami will take Aarti. But even if Swami takes Aarti, uh, that day bhajan has not happened. That means it's not because of me. Okay, so only if the bhajan happens and if I don't sing, there's a problem, isn't it? After two hours of talks, can you believe what Swami does? Swami says, bhajans, and he looks at primary school children. <laughs> Only God can do that. And that day the bhajans were, you know, technically, they were horrible. You know, the small children, how they were. And Swami is enjoying those bhajans. Okay, because he just wanted to show that, you know what, I don't care a damn whether you sing or not. I am going to, I have, if I have decided to enjoy the bhajans, I am going to enjoy the bhajans irrespective of who sings. Don't think, you know. And needless to say, I was off for a month after that. Our bhajan coordinator came and said, you need to do serious introspection, there is something wrong, take an off. That's how generally happens in Prashant If something like this happens, just take an off. So one month, I used to sit back 
you know, and I used to just hear Swami sitting and those days Swami used to sit for extra longer. So, you know, <laughs> Finally, after a month, you know, my chance came. So I said, okay, today let's try. Okay, he slotted me at third budget. And Swami comes out and he's sit seated outside and that day, Swami asks for six speakers. <laughs> six students to speak in front of him. And my heart just sank. I said, Swami, today if I don't sing, no, my bhajan career is over. I'll never be able to sing in front of you. And then one month, you know, continuous introspection, Swami, where am I going wrong? Swami, where am I going wrong? Is my bhajan not good enough to be offered to you? Those are the thoughts, you know, you would go on. And after the six speakers got over, Swami looks up and says, Do bhajan kare. <laughs> saying, Swami, all you need to do is lift up one more finger. <laughs> Why can't we have three versions? What's the logic in having two versions? You know I'm slotted at third. Okay. And, you know, literally I started crying and the greatest broadcast of prayers ever by one man to God, I would say, you know, just Sai Ram, Sai Ram, Sai Ram, Sai Ram, Sai Ram, Sai Ram, continuously crying and saying, Swami, don't get up, don't get up. But he had told two versions. And in those days, you know, he would stretch his hand out to hold that brass, uh, you know, railing in front. And that would be the indication for Aarti. And when he stretches his hand out, it's the time for... So two persons gone over and Swami's right hand stretched out. And my heart sunk. And even as Swami was getting up and the Pujari sir was writing the uh, Aarti, Swami said, let us have one more bhajan. <laughs> And that day I truly meant what I was singing. Allah, you are great. You know, Allah, this, this, this. And you know, that day he stood, Swami with all that pain in his hip, you know, he stood and listened to my entire bhajan and he swayed in the only magical way that he can sway. You know, kept, you know, swaying his hands this way, that way. And after the bhajan, you know, lot of brothers, and after the bhajan he looked at the puja, Abhi, Abhi chalu karo. And so many brothers came and said, Oh brother, how lucky you are, Swami stood for your bhajan. And I knew what Swami had done for me. See, Swami was ready to take upon the physical pain just to teach me a lesson. That is, that is how we should be in terms of not having an ego because he can go to any extent. He can take pain upon himself. He can also deprive you when you are having that. Once Swami had called uh, all the teachers of the university and he had asked, so what subject are you teaching? And one, one professor said, physics Swami. And he asked another teacher, what about you? Swami, chemistry. The third one, Swami management. And Swami was done asking everybody and Swami said, so who's teaching my subject? And they were all perplexed. They said, Swami, what do you mean, Swami? My subject is discipline. Who's teaching my subject? That was the importance that Swami had for discipline. And Swami has even said once that a man is known by his manners. A boy by his behavior. A boy, a good boy should have good behavior. A good man should have good manners. A good devotee, Swami doesn't say you should have good discipline, a good devotion. Swami says you should have good devotee, you should have good discipline. That is the emphasis that Swami lays on discipline. So what is the discipline that we need to have as members of a bhajan group? One of the, one of the most important points that Swami would uh, emphasize on was punctuality. As Amey was saying some time back, see, Swami expected you are there before time, but you are allowed to come five minutes before bhajan, if you are doing practice, if you are doing some other personal work, you better be there much before time. So, there was this time when uh, I was working in the hospital and uh, I got late coming for bhajan. So, by the time I reached the bhajan hall, Swami was already uh, seated on the chair. The bhajan had not started, but Swami was seated. So, when I saw Swami, I sat down quietly at the back of the bhajan hall. And then bhajan started. The next day I was there much before time. I was sitting and then Swami said, uh, in Telugu, he said, uh, Nenna rale du, kal nahi aaya du. So I said, uh, Swami, I was late. Uh, he said, uh, so what? I said, Swami, you were you already seated there. He said, uh, so what? If you are late, you can come. I said, no, Swami, I was late, so I didn't come. So Swami kept goading me many times. He said, kept saying, so what if you are late? You could have come in front. You could have come. And after three or four times, I just kept silent. I knew it was not the right thing to do, all because of what we have seen Swami's, you know, expectations through the years. I just kept quiet. When Swami kept saying, no, you should have come, I just kept quiet. So he kept staring very intently into my eyes. And then finally he patted me and said, 
good boy. You know, he just he just wanted to see if you know I would fall for that trick and say, okay, Swami, next time, you know, even if I'm late, you know, I just <laughs> grab the chance and come. So you know that lesson, and it it happened in the bhajan hall in front of everyone. So it was just you know a lesson you wanted to tell everybody. No, you're late. You sit behind. You don't participate in the leading of the bhajan. Participate in the chorus. Very well done. But he himself would wait for time. That is Swami's punctuality. He could come whenever he wanted. He could start the bhajan. So punctuality is again very very important for uh, a bhajan singer. Well 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 in time. And the uh, a bhajan session is typically marked. The beginning of a bhajan session is marked by om chanting. Right? We chant three times. And Swami has said that when you chant the first om, I am starting from wherever I am. And when you chant the second Om, I'm on the way, I'm traveling to where, wherever you're chanting. And by the time you chant your third Om, I'm seated in the throne. So it's very important that we present ourselves much before Omkaram starts and not walk in with Swami. Yeah, yeah, we don't walk in with Swami. If Swami is seated on the chair, we don't boldly walk in and sit in front of Him. We don't do that. But that, Swami Himself has said this, about this three Omkaram. So that is the importance it uh, gains. Then uh, another thing about uh, the discipline aspect of singing is, uh, Swami would not expect us uh, to have you know uh, undue movements during bhajans or even undue contortions of the face. You know, okay, we are all facing Swami and nobody is looking at our face other than Swami. But isn't that the most important reason we should not contort our faces? You know, Swami, in fact, one of our elder brothers was was doing this because he was he had learnt a lot of Carnatic music and. The elder brother said, you know, typically because of the kind of training they had, you know, there are a lot of movements of the body and contortions of the face and lips. Then Swami told him once, have you once sat in front of a mirror and looked at yourself when you're singing? <laughs> then uh, he said, no, Swami. He said, do that. In fact, his elder brother went back, he did this exercise and, uh, yeah, of course, he got rid of the problem. And Swami was much happier after that. So Swami doesn't uh, expect us to move too much or talk too much or chit chat when we are sitting. Yeah, in fact, I, I, I know of one brother, Swami is so strict, such a strict disciplinarian, one brother in his first year post-graduation when he was, you know, one more year to sing in front of Swami, as the bhajan was going on, he just leant towards the harmonium, he leaned towards the harmonium to hear what should he Swami saw it, he just said, this boy need not sing. For the entire second year after that, in his whole student career after that, he never sang. Just because he leant, no extra movements. Just sit like that. Only Swami is allowed to sway. Nobody else is allowed to sway. You know, that's the kind of discipline that Swami wanted. Another very interesting story which happened to one of our brothers. This particular uh, brother of us, he was to get his braces removed. And in fact, Swami had only told him to get his braces removed. So he had to go to Bangalore for that, to, to go to the dentist. And which would mean that if he takes the train, he would not make it back in time for Bhajans in Prashantinale. He would reach only at 5.30 and Bhajan would have started at 5. So he wanted to tell Swami that, Swami, I will not be able to attend Bhajans tomorrow because I am going to get these braces removed. So he went to Swami and he told Swami, Swami, I just wanted to tell you that I am going tomorrow to get my braces removed as you told me. I will not be able to make it for Bhajans. So Swami said, why? He said, Swami, I will be travelling back from Bangalore. So 5 o'clock, where will you be? Swami, 5 o'clock, I will be in the train. Swami said, wherever you are, at 5 o'clock, between 5 to 5.30, you chant my name. I will be there. I will hear you. So even if you are not able to make it for a particular bhajan session, wherever we are, whatever reason may be, it may be we might be caught up with work, whatever it may be, we just need to think of Swami. And I, I don't think it's it's a lesson that was meant only for that brother. It's meant for any one of us who are not able to make it for a particular bhajan on a particular day. There's no need to feel bad. As long as you keep your time in sync with the bhajan time, rest assured that Swami definitely listen to you. There's just one last aspect of uh, discipline. And Swami said, no chit-chatting when we are sitting there doing bhajans. Because we are all supposed to be concentrating on Swami. Uh, there was this bhajan happening and then uh, people, Swami doesn't expect, expect us to overly appreciate bhajans. See, we are all there. See, we are not appreciating the technical part of bhajans. Somebody gives a good turn, you know, we are not doing this. Ah, ha, ha, wah, 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 wah. We are not doing that. We can go to concerts for doing that. Or, if somebody fumbles, we are not going to smile or make a mockery of that person there during bhajan. Very important. Because two of our uh, brothers did this during an Akhanda bhajan. Somebody had a slip during the bhajan. And then these two brothers happened to look at each other a little bit and just give a little smile, saying that, ah, that person slipped. Swami happened to look at that. Swami happened to see that. Swami was on the chair. 
He is so sternly, I was sitting there, he very sternly looked at both of them and said, Baiti Pampistan. He said, I will send you out if you do this. You know, that is the kind of discipline Swami expects, that you are there for a reason and you should achieve that during the bhajan session. So, so much said about even the delivery, the last and final thing. So, what is the impact? What, what is, if we prepare this way and if we want to run this way, what is going to happen? What is going to be the impact? You know, in this beautiful marathon, there is not just one gold medalist. Everybody is a gold medalist. Right? Each one of us who run this race is a gold medalist. In fact, this race never ends. It will only, the race just keeps going on and on. Every single time that we are able to experience God in a bhajan session, we have won the gold medal. <clears throat> only to, you know, only to egg us on to experience Him the next time also we are sitting in the bhajan session. Isn't it? So, all the time we are running this race and ultimately the realization dawns that I and you are not separate. I and you are one. So that, is the, that is the ultimate aim, that is the ultimate goal of the sadhana of bhajan singing that we are doing. We want to be able to melt Swami's heart, you know, such that He showers so much grace on us that ultimately the, the only time the race ends eventually is when we merge with Him, when He accepts us to Him. You know, melting Swami's heart, this uh, last incident I think, uh, this comes to mind. There was this time when Swami was upset with the boys of the hostel. You know, Swami's typical way of punishing the boys when He thinks they have gone astray is to not talk to the boys. You know, there was no greater punishment for the boys of the college and the school rather than having Swami not talk to them. So this went on for quite a few days and uh, boys would go for the evening darshan but then Swami would not talk to them. He would take devotees for darshan uh, for interview and then he would just sit inside the interview room. And then boys would rush up to Swami and then say, Swami, please forgive us. Swami would brush them off or on occasions he would say, uh, why, what is wrong? I am not, not upset. All is well. And then he would go and close himself up in the interview room. This went on for a week and the boys have had, had it. I mean, one week you are seeing Swami every day and Swami is not interacting. They were at their lowest have been, you know, enthusiasm and they, were, they had nothing left uh, to do in their daily lives. You know, they, it became a mechanical thing going to college and coming back. Then they decided, no, this is too much, we have to pray <coughs> Krishna. And then after, after about four or five days, the entire hostel was up to doing some or the other kind of prayer to Swami. Swami, please forgive us, please forgive us. Now, there were a group of boys who would, uh, who would be chanting Vedam, group of boys who were doing Lalita Sahasranama or Vishnu Sahasranama or chanting something and two, three groups in their own room singing bhajans. And this would go on, you know, come back from Mandir, sing bhajans. You know, studyas would get over, sing the night prayer, sing bhajans after that. This went on for three, four days, and Swami was still not relenting. Swami's heart was not melting and it was nearly 10 days and boys had lost all hope and they said, there is nothing left in this anymore. <coughs> Sorry. At this moment, boys went to Mandir one day and uh, Swami as usual went into the interview room. From the interview room, Swami would wait for the bhajans to start. He would go straight from the interview room onto the throne, sit, take the arati and go back straight into the room. So there was no, no chance for the boys to even ask him anything. So these boys and the whole entire hostel, I was in the hostel then. We were doing bhajans and all kinds of sadhana for about 10, 12 days. And finally boys were at the breaking point of their emotion. That day, Swami came out from the interview room as usual. Bhajans had started, he went and sat on the throne. And one of my elder brothers, he started his bhajan. Sai Prem De, Shanti De, Anand De, Baba Prem De. Now that day, I happened to be sitting on the veranda and I remember about 500 adults, grown up college boys, sobbing at the same time. Including my elder brother who had started this version because the emotion was at such a high when he started Sai Prem with the Anand, the Shanti, the Sai Prem with the, you know, we are, we are hearing for you, Swami. Everybody burst out crying, sobbing. That very instant, Swami got up from the throne, rushed outside, got all the boys, he just said this, and there was a swarm of all the boys 
everyone went surrounded Swami, Swami please we are sorry and there was a lot of crying, so much emotion and you know so much like you know the, the mother had finally forgiven all her children and the children were sobbing in happiness and Swami said why what is wrong, I am happy with you, I am happy with you, there is nothing and all was very well for the, for the entire hostel and it started with that point which broke, that emotion where the entire lot of 500 boys you know unison <coughs> sang out their hearts to Swami and Swami's heart melted that day. And that is what our bhajan should do to the Lord. It should melt his heart such that he pours his grace on us. That is what we should do. <laughs> Swami you know, talks about how a singer should be. You know, he says, he gives a very beautiful, uh, he says, you know, there was one violin which was to be auctioned. It was a very, very dilapidated condition and nobody was buying it. A person is trying to auction it and nobody is buying it. And from the group of people who had come there for the auction, one person got up. He is a master, a master violinist. He goes up to the violin, takes each string, tunes it you know, perfectly and then plays a masterpiece on that violin. And all of a sudden the bid starts to go up for each and every from each and every participant. Swami says, that is what can happen when you have the master's touch. However useless you are, you know, or even however good you are, only when the master touches you, you know, its true worth is known. Let us all have that prayer in our mind. And let us be like, we are all like that violin, Swami. Unless you take us in your hands and play on us, we are nothing but zeros. And, but we know that the moment we get into your hands, you take us into your hands, all the value, all the worth automatically gets attached to it. And the most beautiful feeling for the violin is when the master plays on it. It's not the music that it's created, but just the fact that it is in the master's hands. Let us all give ourselves into the master's hands and let him play the most beautiful music that will enchant this entire universe. Let us be like that camphor, you know, when, and ultimately we do an aarti at the end of our versions, isn't it? The most beautiful significance of the aarti is when we look at that camphor, which is, which is moving around the Lord, it gives us such a beautiful significance, such a beautiful message. Let each one of our lives become like that camphor. No sign that there was any camphor left. Let each one of our lives become like that camphor which continuously does aarti to the Lord because that is the only person worth doing puja for, only worth worshipping with these few messages, these few prayers to Bhagwan, we will end this, this afternoon session and pray that we become worthy instruments in Bhagwan's mission and let our lives become his message. <coughs> Sai Bhajan Bina Sapeshan